Hi, everyone. This is Jason Barrack of Wall Street for Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a first time guest, but I saw his excellent Kitco interview with Michelle Mockery a month ago. Had to reach out to him, had to have him on. He said some really interesting stuff. He was calling for a rally in oil prices in the next couple of months. He nailed that correctly. He was also talking about something I think is really interesting. He laid out the case why the US federal government is underreporting inflation. So I definitely want to ask him about that. He is the founder of Stormwall Advisors. He has three decades of experience as a mergers and acquisitions advisor, a private equity principal. He's been the CEO of multiple publicly traded companies and the chairman of several boards. Michael Wilkerson, thank you for joining me. Hello, Jason. Great to be with you today. So, Michael, we're recording this interview on Tuesday, August 1st, 2023. We got the inflation data a couple of weeks ago. The Consumer Price Index, or as I call it, the CPI or the Changing Propaganda Index, it says it's down about two-thirds from the 12-month-ago high of about 9.1%. You laid out the case in your Kidco interview last month that the U.S. federal government underreports inflation. Why do you think the U.S. federal government would underreport inflation? Well, there are all sorts of reasons for it. Obviously, trying to keep uh, price stability in place and not uh, shock the American consumer. You know, when this came out, when the June number came out at 3%, there was a lot of talk about, look, it, we're down now 12 quarters in a row. We're in disinflation. The word transitory came back into the dialogue around inflation, uh, down obviously from 9.1% in June of last year. But the highlight number, the headline number, belies what's actually going on below. So the entire reason why inflation is coming down over the past, or headline inflation is coming down over the past several uh, months has been energy prices. The fact that, uh, that, that gas, oil have been coming down double digit levels. But if you look across the sectors, and just go back to let's call it the depth of the pandemic uh, or lockdowns in June of 2020. From there to till this June, call it three years on, headline inflation has up has been up by 18 percent on average. But look across the categories: oil up 82 percent, gas up 71 percent, food up 20 percent, electricity 24 percent, transportation 30 percent. These are all of the things that people live on. And so part of the issue here is you've got, uh, in a way, hiding the information behind the headline number and the fact that it's coming off of what, at least in the first and second quarter, was declining energy prices. We're seeing that reverse even as we speak over the last few weeks with oil starting to move up, gas prices moving up again. But you have also this interplay, as you know, between uh, the the, infl- the inflation rate and what is going on at the Federal Reserve. That's a whole other conversation we can get into. But I actually believe if you look back at what's happened really uh, since the global financial crisis, there's been a lot of incentive to hide what is actually going on uh, behind this, these lower numbers. But um, Americans and, are, aren't confused. They realize what's happening. They experience it with their pocketbooks everything that they have to live on. And by the way, this is not just a U.S. phenomenon. It's happening across Europe. Their inflation numbers for uh, July, at least preliminaries, just came out. Uh, and they're still running headline uh, inflation at 5.3%, basically flat from 5.5% in June. Uh, and just like in the U.S., when you get below the surface of the decline in energy prices, you see that uh, that in Europe, food is still running at 11%. Um, on, a, on an annual basis. So this is a real issue that's affecting all sorts of categories. Yeah, I agree. I don't think any government's honest about inflation these days. I mean, I I think China has inflation near zero and Japan has had low inflation rates compared to the amount they've devalued the yen recently. They have yield curve control problems. They had to do emergency bond buying. There's just tons of examples, especially in the US, because there was a lot of people documenting the shrinkflation over the last 10 or 15 years, I think the average person out there, Michael, and I've heard people talk about this recently, is that there's really only been consumer price inflation for three years. I've heard a lot of people say that, but there's a lot of currency and credit that's been sloshing around the last 10 or 15 years post-2008. I want to come back to your question, why? (laughs) Why would governments do this? Well, the simple answer is called in economic terms, financial repression. So the idea here is to be able to keep uh, interest rates below real inflation as a way to deal with an over-indebtedness problem. As, as you appreciate uh, 
when a government gets itself uh, over levered as the US is, as Japan is, as is the uh, as is Europe, there are really only three ways out of that mess. One is default, not really an option for the issuer of the world's reserve currency. Two is to tax your citizens uh, and, and try to solve it that way. That ends up with uh, pitchforks and torches in the street. Or to inflate it away, uh, inflate away the debt problem. And the way to do that is to, uh, again, keep official inter uh, interest rates below the actual rate of, of price increase, price index. And that, I believe, is the heart of what has been going on uh, over the last decade or two. As you said, it's a lot longer than three years. Yeah, if people follow the Austrian school true money supply, I mean, from 2008, 2009, the bank bailouts to 2019, it was up 160 percent. That's not counting the same way the Federal Reserve PhD economists do with M1 and M2. It's counting it a little bit differently. And then over what from 2020 to 2022, it wasn't just the U.S. It was all these governments and central banks. They created many trillions of dollars. I don't know the exact number, but I think the U.S. alone was over five trillion just in the U.S. And that's not counting all the other governments that created trillions and handed out stimmy checks while the economy wasn't producing any actual goods. Well, even if you stick with the government's definition, you look at M2, M2 tripled uh, between 2007 uh, and last year. Now, it started to come down marginally. People get very excited about that. But it's still up nearly 300% from, from that initial starting point. A lot of that, of course, has been driven by deficit spending and the increased debt that was used to, uh, to pay those checks and, and otherwise. But to your point, so let's just start with that and say the money supply has tripled in that 15 or so year period. And it's up 40% from uh, uh, 2019 uh, through the pandemic years, where to your point, uh, the money supply was increased pretty substantially. So in my view, this is a this is at the heart of the issue around where inflation is. Sure, it was about uh, deconfinement, coming out of lockdowns, opening up the economy. All of those things were true. That was really the catalyst in my mind that 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 unleashed what was going to be inevitable, which is to say, this lag that we see between money supply growth. And having that realized in uh, in the price index, in the prices of, of goods and services. Yeah, we started to see stagflation and shrinkflation that the average person out there for the last 10 or 15 years really didn't notice until the last two or three years. But I would argue that it was there in the past. It's just most people didn't notice it. I mean, I was taking pictures showing shrinkflation of goods. I was listening to conference calls. The average person doesn't know that. But when the stagflation and the shrinkflation, Michael, are, say, high single digits or double digits um, for a certain amount of time, at least 12 months, I mean, the average person is going to wake up and start Googling inflation and stagflation and shrinkflation. You know, Jason, I wrote an article a few months back because I did this little exercise. I went back, you know, I've been an Amazon Prime user for several years, and I, I'm also a data nut. I like to look at, you know, the figures and that sort of thing. So I went back on my own purchases for uh, a, a three-year period beginning in, well, 2019, 2020, and I looked across goods that I consume, you know, every every month, every quarter, whatever it is. And clearly, you know, in many cases, like basic things like bottled water or uh, detergents or other food stuff where I could just I could see across time and the increase in prices was substantially higher than the food index. In other words, I was seeing increases of 30, 40, 50 percent over that three year period. I was shocked. Now, I appreciate that's anecdotal and it isn't an index in the way that they use it. But I think that's the reality that consumers are, are experiencing. Uh, and it's much worse than what the indexes are showing. Do you think another major reason that the U.S. federal government underreports inflation or the real inflation rate is cost of living adjustments for Social Security and government employee pension plans? Uh, absolutely. It has to be. So, as you know, coming out of previous inflations in the U.S., whether it be you know, labor unions or otherwise, or eventually people caught on to this. And so most uh, these most federal contracts these days, Social Security, other other entitlements, pensions for federal workers, and for private sector unionized, which aren't as strong as they used to be, but nonetheless, they all reflect these uh, CPI indexed uh, increases in the cost of living, COLA increases, and so absolutely there is a broad incentive for both the government and 
uh, for private sector employers to keep a tap on this and to keep that number from rising too quickly. And yet we're starting to see more of these private sector employee unions. I think it was United Airlines, what they they negotiated almost a 40% increase in wages. So we're starting to see that. And I don't think that's uh, the consumer price index is going to accurately reflect that for small business owners and private companies. Yeah. So I think you see something interesting happening. So if you look at what was going on in corporate profits over the last few quarters, so going back into last year, into 2020. Two, what you were seeing, if I could just generalize, very limited volume growth, big price growth on the top line. So consumer products companies were taking price, not able to get much revenue growth on volume, but they were getting it all on price and margins were expanding because for a period of time, consumers were accepting these price increases. And at the same time, these corporations were paying away less as a percent of sales, percent of revenue to their employees. Well, that's beginning to change. And so you see, for example, in the second quarter earnings, which we're still in the middle of earnings season, but getting getting quite a bit of information now, that we're starting to see some compression. We're seeing, again, very limited volume growth and consumers starting to push back because they're, they're, they're getting pressed beyond their means. And at the same time, you're seeing uh, profit margins are beginning to compress. Why is it? I believe the biggest reason is the one that you just alluded to is we're now hitting this period where uh, labor is starting to catch up and start to get, let's say, I would argue, a fairer share of those price increases that that are that are going on. But that is going to impact margins, profit margins across the publicly listed companies are already coming down in the second quarter. We saw a slow slowing in the growth in the first quarter as well. Now, what's interesting is you look at what's happening, of course, with equity markets, with stock prices, and the, the markets could care less about any of this. The fact that uh, the Fed just raised rates another 25 basis points now with a 5.5% upper bound uh, in its uh, Fed funds target rate, the fact that we've had this, this banking crisis, the fact that we are seeing, again, a weakness in corporate earnings, corporate profits, slowing growth, slower expectations for the rest of the year. But nonetheless, uh, stock prices are going back up. And it's because not because of earnings growth, but because margin, excuse me, um, multiples, price to earnings multiples are beginning to expand again. So on the sort of historical basis, the uh, Case-Shiller, good, good old classic index of price to earnings is now back up above 31 times again. So this this whole season, Jason, it reminds me a little bit of like this, uh, this high school cake party where everybody's out in the field having a good old time and not really noticing that the cops are approaching on all sides. And I think what's going to happen is we're going to have this moment where the lights come on and people are going to scatter for the hills uh, because all all of a sudden the party's over. The lights come on, the music goes off. Until then, you definitely have the sentiment in the equity markets, at least, different different circumstances in the bond market, that as long as the music's playing, we're going to keep on dancing Let's enjoy the party. Uh, I don't know when the cops are arriving, but somebody is going to have to pull uh, pull the punch bowl here uh, before too much longer. Yeah, I think I saw that around 80% of the companies that are reported earnings for Q2 2023 have beaten earnings. So that's pretty crazy. But I guess the financial engineering with the chief financial officers is quite good these days. Yeah. Yeah, you're you're seeing it, uh, and again, because you're still you're still getting price increases, even if there's no sales uh, volume growth happening. But uh, it's been it's been a, a surprise to a lot of people. Do you think then that this lag effect for the rate hikes, the twelve plus months now, what fourteen months of interest rate increases at the fastest pace in history for the Federal Reserve Bank, that we're going to start to see the lag effect for a lot of these private sector companies come into play soon? Absolutely, and I think this this is an important point you bring up. This lag effect is that people just assume that okay, well, rates are rates have gone up, and uh, I, I do find it interesting that the equity markets again have looked right through it. They don't seem to care. Uh, you know, there was more nervousness around it a year, year and a half ago, but right now, fifty point basis points here, twenty five there. Probably get another twenty five in September. The market doesn't you know believes I think in the end that we are going to return to an era of, of easy money and doesn't and, and doesn't really care. However, where would you see the lag effect coming in? I think some of the the obvious places is going to be in debt in debt refinancing in the in, in corporate corporate bond markets, corporate debt markets. Um, as long as you can still pay yesterday's rates, then you don't see the effect of it. 
we're beginning to see it this year in that I think you are probably very aware that, you know, year to date this year, the number of corporate debt defaults have already exceeded 2020's level. I think that's going to keep growing for this reason, that as uh, maturity dates hit, as companies are forced to refinance or repay, uh, that they're going to have a hard time doing that, moving from 50 basis points, 1% to, you know, 5% risk-free rates uh, and, and above. I think that there's still a lot of liquidity out there, so maybe it isn't the end of the world for a lot of companies, but I do believe this lag effect is going to hit. And of course, a lot of talk about uh, how it will impact the federal government with its uh, debt service obligations going forward. Um, Once again, the market seems to be looking right through that. Um, We've put on, since the end of the year, another trillion and a half of of national debt, of, of federal debt, hasn't, the market really hasn't blinked uh, anywhere along the way. Uh, cost of capital for a lot of these private sector companies is much, much higher. We're starting to see this in the oil industry. A lot of the non-publicly traded oil producers, so these are companies that own some wells in the Permian Basin, oil, natural gas, their cost of capital is so much higher. They've been selling out their assets, which are producing wells to the EOG resources and Pioneer Natural Resources and Chevron. So they've been selling because their cost of capital is so high, they can't go raise funds. They just sold the businesses and the assets to a larger oil and natural gas company that's publicly traded with a much lower cost of capital. So I think we're going to see more of that going forward. I would. I think you're going to see that. You're going to see consolidation, which I guess is what you were saying, really, that these companies are being forced to, to sell and others buying. You're seeing a lot of dislocation. Um, you mentioned at the beginning of the program, the beginning of the show, that uh, you know I had said a month or two ago that I did expect oil prices to rise. We're seeing that. You know, just today, uh, we the crude oil inventories came out and fell pretty pretty significantly by over 15 million uh, barrels um, week on week, and so that was a, a much bigger draw than people were expecting. We're seeing prices rise, of course. Then also, uh, we have Russia pulling back on what they're shipping and exporting. So we're seeing, you know, prices kind of grow across the board. And, and again, we talked about this earlier in, the, in, in in our discussion, but this, the the decline in oil prices was the almost complete reason for the mitigation in CPI and in headline uh, inflation. And if we see any sort of consistency here in, in rising oil prices, all of that is going to reverse and I've been pretty consistent, at least this year, in saying that I do believe that by the end of the year, uh, that we are going to see inflation uh, rise again to high single digits, if not more. Oil could be the catalyst here. So you expect then kind of a second wave of inflation similar to the 1970s. So for the listeners who are not familiar, we had the Federal Reserve chairman before Paul Volcker, who was Arthur Burns, and he thought he had been inflation. Then he he paused the rate hikes. He stopped them. And then a second wave of inflation in the mid 1970s kicked off. Do you think we could see something similar in the next uh, 12, 18, 24 months? I, I do. And I think uh, Chairman Powell is very well aware of the history of the 70s. And really, but Volcker also made a similar mistake of, of letting things off a little bit sooner than he needed to and seeing another bout of it come back. Powell's aware of the history. The the the, the, the chairman, uh, the, the board of the Federal Reserve are aware of it. So I think that is why you're seeing this more hawkish language of saying that uh, higher for longer as far as rates go, and that I think that they're going to be very cautious and very careful before uh, they let rates start to come down again. And that's one reason I believe the market may be wrong here. Uh, and, and sorry, in terms of pricing in a reduction in rates and getting back to a more easy, easy money regime, uh, a lot of the signals that we're seeing out of the Fed in the language, not, not necessarily in the press release, but in Powell's comments just a few days ago, I think raise the probabilities of a September or subsequent further increase, and again higher higher for longer that rates will stay elevated. Um, and I think there was some commentary coming out of his comments uh, into into 2025 before there's any real meaningful reduction. I think if that happens in that scenario, I think a lot of regional banks and commercial real estate are going to have a lot of problems. What's been uh, really shocking to me. You know, and I lived through 
as you did, uh, the global financial crisis. I had a frontline seat. I was an emerging acquisition advisor for Lazard at the time, working in financial institutions. We were advising a lot of the banks, a lot of the non-bank financial institutions who were in deep, deep crisis at that time. And so I saw what happened and I saw you know, the, the, the way things played out. This is certainly not the same as that. It is very different. But at the same time, we've seen this year three of the four largest bank failures in all of U.S. history. And after a brief hiccup, the market kind of shrugged it off across all fronts. Um, you know, we have seen continued pressure, of course, in the regional banks, the community banks, but the two big to fail banks are marching along as well as ever before. You you mentioned earlier the lag effect. Well, I think you're seeing the lag effect here in the banking sec- sector, absolutely, in that you know, for the moment, they're pushing the banks are pushing the, the can down the road. Uh, not being forced to realize losses, not being forced to mark to market on a lot of these held to maturity loans and other assets for commercial real estate or for whatever sector it might be. And I think time will be the tell here. I think, it, and, it, and I like to remind people that remember that it was six months between uh, Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers. Le- Bear Stearns weekend, first or second weekend of March, Lehman Brothers not until uh, first or second weekend of September, almost uh, six months to the day. So, uh, so I think it's it's important that we realize that we, in my view, may be in a calm before the storm or a lull here uh, between the next drawdown of, uh, of, of of issues in the banking sector. Yeah, I totally agree. It definitely feels like 2005, 2006, and 2007 all over again. The oil price is starting to rally. The stock market seems to not really price in any bad news right now. But I think one of the main reasons we haven't had, we've had like a large gap many months since uh, Silicon Valley Bank and First Republic, is that these uh, banks are drawing from these shadow liquidity programs and there's just big spikes in them, like the FHLB, the BTFP, the Fed's discount window. So the Mm -hmm. Fed's balance sheet is what is being reduced officially by $95 billion a month with quantitative tightening. But these shadow liquidity programs the last couple of weeks have had absolutely enormous spikes of many hundreds of billions of dollars. Yeah, go back all the way to March and the draws begin to go. As you mentioned, there's all these programs. There was there's the federal home home loan banks for sure. But at the time of Silicon Valley Bank, uh, the Fed Treasury coordination put in uh, additional additional programs uh, for access to liquidity. I haven't checked this week, but at least up into the, through the last couple of weeks, those emerge, let's call them just generally the emergency funding lines have been tapped at record levels and the numbers aren't going down. So traditional sources of funding for the banks is it, simply not there. It's not a surprise when you consider that uh, treasuries are now yielding somewhere, let's call it around 5%, the money market funds are yielding around 5%, and bank deposits cannot keep up, at least not profitably for the bank. So the banks are in a real catch-22. These emergency funding lines are really the only thing that are holding up the banks, providing liquidity at a rate that doesn't turn uh, their p l upside down and start to cause real depletion of capital levels uh, for the banks. Although, again, I believe it's coming uh, and it's just it's a matter of time as this, as this slow leak continues. Well, I mean, if the banks are going to continue to borrow what at around 5% or close to that cost of capital from FHLB, they're replacing uh, cheap depositor capital with much higher cost of capital, their net interest margins are going to be screwed up. They just haven't ridden off the losses yet on their bonds or commercial real estate loans or small business loans. Once they're, they start writing off those losses, the investors are going to see what that they need to go raise equity capital, except the regional banks can't raise equity capital. And then they get into what a situation similar to First Republic Bank or Silicon Valley Bank. And this is the vicious circle. This is the circle that we saw in 2008. And that's where there is an analog. There is a similarity. Is that once you start having to take losses, realize losses, capital goes very, very quickly under normal circumstances, normal market environment. You raise capital because you're making an acquisition, you're expanding, you're doing something interesting. You might get an, get an attractive offer from the market. In an environment like this, where you're being forced to raise capital, the market doesn't want it, you're, it makes no sense to raise capital at a substantial discount to your book value, but you're forced to, the vicious circle begins. Of course, even with Silicon Valley Bank, we saw this and that they made a, a last minute attempt to try to shore up uh, capital 
the market just puked all over it. And it was from there really just a matter of days, 48 hours until the whole thing fell apart. That is what we can't forget here is the rapidity at which these things happen once they start to unwind. We've said it again, but I'll, I'll say it. I've said it before, I'll say it again, that you know we're in this sort of eye of the storm moment here where it's been quite calm uh, for the last uh, several weeks. I don't think it's over. When it comes again, you know, usually there's a there's some sort of catalyst, some sort of trigger. Once it happens, these events can move very, very quickly. And this was the you know the uh, the metaphor of the, of the the crashing of the party by law enforcement here at some point, uh, in that it will happen very fast when it does come. Well, in the real economy, and I think there's a big divergence now between asset markets and the real economy. But the Fed just had a survey released yesterday, and a lot of the banks just said they're drastically tightening credit. So these are all signs. Normally, when the banks are drastically tightening credit, they're kind of raising cash. They're trying to figure out how to hunker down for the storm, like you said, in the eye uh, there we're about to hit maybe the other eye of the hurricane, the other side of the wall. So there's this, you know, we, we've had this disconnect, of course, between the financial markets, asset prices, and the real economy for a long time now. This was driven by ZERP, by the zero interest rate policy of the last 15, 20 years, they created, I think, from, from the beginning, the separation, the financialization of the economy, the everything bubble. You know, we're now seeing the beginning of that unwind, although <laughs> to the lag effect that we've been talking about, it's not really reflecting in asset prices. We're still very, very high uh, in equity markets, as, as we've talked about, very, very high in other asset classes as well. We, we're seeing weakness in real estate, but not really the breaking point. What will drive, you know, and if, if we had had this conversation six months ago, seven months ago, I would have said, and I did say in other forums, recession likely back at, mid mid 2023. That's been punted. It's been kicked down the road, I would argue, because even though we were seeing raising rates, we've, we've still had the the, the Biden economic plan, which is to push a lot of liquidity, a lot of uh, money into the markets over a trillion dollars that have gone in all sorts of different things, sort of put off the reckoning. It is what you just described, the credit crunch, the tightening of credit that will really force the hand because we're not going to see uh, the economy be able to, to grow uh, and renew when Main Street doesn't have access to capital. The big money center banks will continue to lend to the governments, will continue to lend to large corporations. My fear, my concern here is this really is going to further impact Main Street, further impact the middle class, further impact uh, businesses that rely on their community banks, on their regional banks that don't have access to the money center banks uh, who won't lend to them because they're too busy making money elsewhere. When that happens, I do think you're going to see what's been a a reasonably resilient U.S. economy with you know, two, two, uh, two plus percent growth over the last couple of quarters, 2.4 2. second quarter, began to show weakness, significant weakness. And by the way, Jason, I think what was being missed a lot in the financial press here in the U.S., this process has already started in Europe. Now, of course, we had a massive uh, bank failure in the form of, of Credit Suisse back in March, being swallowed up by, by UBS. But look, but, but there were other issues in the UK banks in, in the quarters before that. If you look at growth, um, the, the 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 biggest markets in Europe are in recession. So Germany has been negative for two quarters in a row. They just they, they printed flat zero point zero in the second quarter, but fourth quarter, first quarter negative prints. Uh, France is barely hanging on to a positive number. UK zero point one zero point one. So essentially. Uh, the eurozone is already in in recession. Credit is driving part of the issue there. A lot of that, of course, has to do with energy markets, the conflict between Russia and Ukraine, the sanctions re regime. So the U.S. is floating above uh, some of those things for the moment, but I don't foresee it lasting um, much longer. Also, I see, uh, well, with the global macroeconomic data, I see a lot of uh, signs of recession and problems with other countries compared to the U.S.'s data. So if you believe the U.S.'s data, I mean, so 
uh, China, emerging markets, European Union, Japan, the data, except for the Japanese stock market, which I think is pricing in a devalued Japanese yen. But pretty much yep. everything else seems in a recession or uh, worse than a recession now compared to the US. But we're starting to see a lot of signs with these higher interest rates now starting to price into the real economy. There's a lot of signs that the consumer, unless they're super affluent and they're making $500,000 a year or more, and they have a lot of assets that are generating income, they're starting to substitute. They're starting to trade down. They're starting to get tapped out, especially with cre- uh, a lot of consumers who have lower paying jobs and their credit card interest rates. I mean, the I getting credit card applications for 29.5% APR, it's just absolutely ridiculous. And what the average American has, what, o- almost $6,000 credit card balance and is paying sky high interest rates. Yeah, so the optimistic view has been what's been people have been calling, you know, the the the, the Barbie economy. You know, the consumers are still out there traveling, still out there spending on consumer goods. The underlying, more sordid reality is that they're maxing out of their credit cards, they're depleting their savings. Well, savings came back up a little bit, but you're seeing it in credit card card balances. You're seeing that consumers are. And I just I keep going back to this uh, to this cake party metaphor here that they're they're enjoying the last round or last couple of rounds. Um, but but there will be a there will be a reckoning, and I think they're hitting the end of, of their limit. Just go back to the basics. Uh, we've talked about food a little bit earlier, but just go back to gasoline. You know, we've seen now now gas prices are up twenty percent year to date. Uh, we're seeing average prices now above three 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 dollars again uh, for, uh, across the country, worse in, in some regions, and that is moving forward. That's going to put a big pinch uh, on on the consumer, and essentially. The consumer is just running out of, of road, running out of runway to be able to keep spending the way that they had. You pointed out, you know, for credit cards, we're now seeing some of the highest rates. I mean, they've always been, uh, you know, we'll use the word usurious in many in many situations, but uh, it's, it, they're going back up and it's getting more difficult. And the offers are still out there because there's still uh, all this massive liquidity in the market that uh, is trying to find a home. So I see a lot of other experts talking about deflation's coming, deflation's a threat. Do you think the people in power will actually allow deflation for a long period of time without rules changes, uh, hidden liquidity programs, bailouts, uh, saving banks? Do you think we're going to see a lot of the similar rules changes to 2008, 2009, and 2020 going forward if there is deflation and bankruptcies for, say, a couple months? So when I hear deflation, I I always come back to deflation in what? You know, because we've been, yes, we have been in a long period of deflation of goods as technology has advanced. You know, think about all the advances in computer technology, communications technology, goods, uh, production, apparel, all that sort of stuff. That's defla- that has been deflationary over the long run. That's what uh technology and productivity enhancements do. When they say deflation and they're starting to talk about energy markets, they're starting to talk about uh, food, shelter, transportation, these are the things that have been the real driver services. It's very hard for me to see what will lead to a deflationary environment. Um, So even with some of these bankruptcies and other things, and part of it, I go back to more of a, you know, monetarist view around what's causing inflation to begin with. And we are not seeing uh, the sort of fiscal discipline, monetary discipline that would lead me to believe that you would have broad based price index declines. Now, maybe maybe you can um, describe what you've heard a little more specifically. There's something that that I'm not hitting on this point. I just don't see it uh, in terms of the, the sort of deflation that people talk about that would go a, cut across these um, these categories that have been really the drivers of Uh, price inflation, both here and in Europe. Well, also, I think the policymakers, so those are politicians and and also central bankers, after a couple months of quote unquote deflation, and we had a little bit of it in 2008 and obviously some in 2020, they just seem to panic. And a lot of it is over tax receipts for all levels of government, especially if asset prices collapse. So you have the real economy, it's not producing goods and services, people aren't going out uh, shopping or going out to eat. And yes, that hurts the local government. But for the federal government, I mean, over the last couple of decades, it's become very reliant on capital gains tax receipts receipts and property taxes, especially capital gains tax receipts for stocks, bonds, and real estate. You know, what What you will never hear any government official say, anyone at the Fed, anyone in the Biden administration, the government wants inflation. They need inflation. They are the largest debtor 
uh, in the economy. And for them, uh, inflation is a hidden tax. It's a way to uh, navigate what is a looming debt crisis, the overlevered you know, 32.7 as of today, a uh, trillion dollar federal deficit plus you know, state and local plus unfunded liabilities for entitlements, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It goes on and on and on. The only way to deal with that is to allow in- inflation to run. Again, counter to the mandate of the Fed, you'll never hear Jerome Powell say it. Maybe he doesn't believe it. But for the government itself as a whole, uh, as a as a debtor in the world, um, there, there's, to your point, absolutely no interest in a, in a deflationary environment or even a, a price stable, a 2% inflation environment. It is counter to this looming issue of the need to address uh, a debt problem and a deficit problem. The other reason I don't think we'll see deflation for a long period of time is if there is deflation for, say, six months or a year, these commodities on the supply side, the supply will just come offline. The the miners, the oil producers, they won't their cost of capital will go up in bankruptcies and defaults. The the interest rates could rise or cost of capital could go up. It wouldn't go lower. And then you could see even more supply side problems. We saw this in the oil market with 2020 when oil briefly went negative. Well, look how much supply came offline. Yeah, temporarily, they were storing oil on tankers because there was so much oil they didn't know what to do with. But then the supply came offline and then then there was supply problems. What within uh, eight to 12 months, enormous supply problems. No, that that's exactly right. So it's like all of the all of the the natural order of the world, okay, will resist the kind of inflation that uh, that you're describing. Um, not just governments, but corporations, businesses, etc. Uh, it does not it does not work, and uh, it would be very difficult to see this happen. Well, the other part about deflation in commodities is, is I think like there's just been drastic underinvestment for a lot of these key commodities in food, energy, some of the other ones. For many, many years that people see, oh, they see what a $5 copper price for six months, but they don't understand that it takes eight to 12 years sometimes to get a copper mine permitted and built. So even though there was a high copper price for what, six to 12 months, almost no new supply came online. The same thing is true for a lot of other commodities too. Well, you're you're touching on a, on a broader issue, which is, again, go back to uh, the ZERP era. When money's free... You no longer have a mechanism to discern uh, between good projects and bad projects. So the right things don't get built and invested in, and the wrong things do. In- interest rates are are the, the the measuring tool. They're the mechanism, the sorting mechanism, to identify between good projects and bad. When everything is zero percent or one percent risk free rate, there's no price signal. There's nothing left. And so what you had over this this past a decade or two really was significant underinvestment in things that matter, things where we did need with the right signal on what is the true cost of capital investment to be made, and then enormous sums squandered around the world on investments that never should have been made, on projects that never would have been uh, realized. And now we're in this sort of aftermath hangover of that period of time trying to figure out uh, where are we? What do we have? Where have we invested in? Whether it be infrastructure, whether it be in, as you said, long live, you know, mines or other projects that take uh, years or a decade to to get up and running, and we missed all of that, and now have to almost uh, maybe not start from scratch, but certainly well behind where we need to be in real real investments in real projects with real uh, economic value. Yeah, I agree. Almost all the oil investment, oil production growth the last 15 years has come from the Permian Basin. So there's been very little exploration and production growth from a lot of other areas. Now, there's a few other oil production growth areas potentially in like offshore Guyana and Suriname and stuff like that. But those are just getting started. There's been very little globally, though. Well, it's worse than that. Uh, You're talking exploration and production, which is absolutely right. The point you're making but in but in terms of refining, we absolutely shot ourselves in the foot. So during 2020, uh, companies made the decision, refiners made the decision to close down because it looked like demand was going to be out for a very long time. We brought uh, production capacity down. We're now, I believe, 17 billion, uh, billion barrels a day, million barrels a day, something that like is now the lowest level since 2014. So we actually went backwards over the next three years, and of course with the regulatory red tape that exists in this country today around the, the entire uh, 
upstream or downstream for oil and gas, no new refining capacity is going to come on. And that's why you're seeing these intermittent spikes in diesel and other things that we saw last year. Uh, we, we've taken out rather than built refining capacity. And that is going to be a very difficult challenge to solve. Do you think there's going to be much higher price floors in oil and natural gas going forward then? I do. And of course, that's that's over a longer term view. I'm very bullish on both oil and oil and gas right now. That's a tough one to say. Well, oil is coming back. Gas still remains, uh, I think, pretty, pretty weak. But if it, so I'll still stick with the word you use, which is over the long, long term, not you know, necessarily short term. We're going to see fluctuations, although even in the medium term, I think through the end of this year, uh, I'm bullish about where, where oil is going to go. And we've seen it in the last couple of weeks. But in the let's call it three to five year range, I, I continue to be very, very bullish. Why? You know, growth is going to come back online. We're not going to see the uh, progress that, that uh, markets, governments and others expected to make in terms of zero carbon and in, in, in green energy, other, other things. Um, you can't just wish these things into existence. You can't create an, a utopia off of, technolo- of, of a technology that doesn't exist. So I actually think that we're going to see you know, more pressure uh, and, and more strength behind oil, gas, and traditional resources than what a lot of the market gives credit for. There's a lot of long-term demand for growth for natural gas. China just booked a 30-year contract with Qatar for more liquefied natural gas supply. So I I think long-term, there's going to be a lot of demand growth. In the short term, I mean, it's probably going to slosh around in a trading range. But if it goes much lower, there's going to be a lot of supply that's going to be uneconomic and it'll come offline. I think when oil got into the low 60s, I think you were starting to see that. We're already starting to see the rig count come down significantly now for oil. So we're getting close to a bottom in oil if it hasn't already already bottomed. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And again, it goes back to the point you're making, uh, which is the, you know, the, the lag effect. You take capacity offline, uh, you try to bring it back online to create new capacity. You can't just turn this overnight, flip a switch. This takes years in many cases to, to realize. Well, the other part with oil is depletion. So the average person doesn't think about this, but we've been producing oil out of the Permian Basin, what, since 2008? So all the best wells, probably all the tier one acreage has already been drilled. Those wells are depleted. They brought online to about 4,000, almost 4,000 drilled, but uncompleted wells from 2020 to 2022. So those wells are depleting now. They're going to have to drill more wells, but the oil service companies aren't getting business for Q3 and Q4. <laughs> right. No, no, you're absolutely you're absolutely right. You know, so for these reasons and more, I remain you know, pretty bullish on oil and gas and, and, the, and the commodities uh, sector generally. I think you're going to see, as you said, some short term up and downs, but there are just a lot of factors driving driving us forward here. Are you surprised that the gold price isn't higher given all the problems with central banks, the buying from non G seven central banks, the inflationary pressures in other countries? I am perpetually surprised about. The lack of movement, lack of direction in the gold market. Um, I've been wrong on you know, two two things. I think where I was most wrong on starting in, in twenty twenty one was the direction of the U.S. dollar, and the other was on gold. Uh, the one the, the the dollar strengthened as much as it did, and the fact that gold uh, actually from that starting point in twenty twenty went up and down, and then stayed down, and now sort of in a in a, in a trading range for a long time. You know, on this one, on gold in particular, I do I do tend to fall into the camp of looking at the derivatives market as the uh, the responsible person here, the responsible entity, just thinking about uh, the amount of derivative contracts on gold held by the big money center banks. Uh, I think again, there's a lot of incentive out there to not have again going back to governments that link to inflation, link to other things, to not have gold spike, not have it freely traded. So you look at what appears to be spot price based on what you're seeing, and, and it's not real. It's not, it's not, these aren't real transactions. These are con, these are derivative contracts in, as you know, uh, hundreds and thousands of times, you know, actual, actual real physical gold volume. At the same time that, to your point, you're seeing central banks begin to uh, accumulate again shift reserves from from dollar dollars to uh to gold and uh so it doesn't make sense unless uh in my mind the only thing that does make sense is that like libor uh 
like the mortgage uh, securities market in mid 2000s, LIBOR later in 11, that uh, there's suffering afoot. There's something going on here that uh, that just isn't. You, isn't you could say paper right. price manipulation. We're not Kiko. <laughs> <laughs> Right. So it just it does not smell right. And uh, I don't believe it is right. And I think there's a paradigm shift here for the non G7 central banks. So these is, this is not like the Bank of Japan, the European Central Bank. These are the emerging market countries, China, the BRICS. There's been a paradigm shift really the last six to eight months. I think they've seen what happened with Russia and their 300 billion of reserves. And they're saying we have to diversify away from U.S. Treasuries because if we do something that D.C. doesn't like with our foreign policy, they could put sanctions on us. They could just confiscate our reserves, hundreds of billions of dollars or some similar amount. And we're going to start diversifying away from U.S. Treasuries. There's no doubt. Now, you know, the sanctions regime, I think. When the U.S. imposed sanctions on Russia round one in 2014 following Crimea, this was a huge wake-up call for Russia, for China, for the BRICS, for, for, for the world. And what I think is underestimated is that the, the time between 2014 and 2022 was not wasted by Russia, by China. They thought about this long and hard. I'm not saying they've arrived at a perfect solution, but they became very focused on how would we navigate another round of sanctions. And you know, Russia uh, was, of course, put under the, the U.S.-led sanctions re regime in early 2020, and they had an opportunity to try some of those things out, uh, you know, outside of SWIFT. New markets, new home for for oil, other facilities, even if you know, finding ways around the sanctions regime. I think the era of U.S. sanctions warfare is coming to an end. It's going to come to an end because uh, nations have gotten smarter about how to deal with them. And it's one thing, you know, to impose sanctions on the Sudan. It's another thing. To impose sanctions on a nation as large as as Russia or China or otherwise, so I, I think that we unfortunately thinking that we were the U.S. thinking that it was backing Putin into a corner, we've really backed ourselves into a corner here uh, in terms of our ability to maneuver now. Uh, once you once you've entered into the sanctions warfare. Yeah, I agree. There's been a lot of financial warfare actually for for years now, five, six, seven years at least. I think it's a double edged sword for the US and DC with foreign policy to weaponize the dollar in US Treasury. So they think that they're going, oh, we got you. We got this government. We got them. We got them by the balls. They're in trouble. But then it ends up backfiring, I don't know, months later or a year or two later. Well, that's that's exactly right. And if you look at what has happened, you know, in Russia, and I did some work on this a few months back, is you know, basically nothing. <laughs> they they have been able to reshift their exports of gas and oil and other resources uh, elsewhere. Uh, other nations have picked up slack: China, India, some of the the non-aligned uh, parts of the world. And uh, they their inflation rate has been no worse than uh, the U.S. or Europe's. At the same time, Europe's economy, as we talked about earlier, around their their economic growth, has just tanked altogether. All I'm not saying Russia has solved the problem. I mean, they're obviously facing uh, enormous strain as well. But it wasn't the you, know, you could go back and listen to the language of the U.S. officials in April of 2022. They're like, "Yep, this is it. You know, this is this is the most devastating, all inclusive round of sanctions ever unleashed on any other nation, and this is going to." You know, teach them a lesson, bring the war to an immediate conclusion. Well, none of it happened. Uh, and um, and really, it's been the Western economies that have suffered of, as a result. Well, this is the same Biden administration that's saying we've got inflation beat. We've got inflation down. Gasoline prices are lower. We've created all these jobs. Hunter Biden's not a career criminal. So, I mean, all the lies and spin uh, and not that the Republicans are much better, uh, both political parties, unfortunately, there's a lot of there's a lot of bad things coming out of both political parties in D.C. I've lived outside of D.C. for 20 years, and it just seems like every few years, both political parties just get worse and worse with the problems in Congress and in the White House. Yeah, I think what's interesting and it's reasonable to ask 
is this time different or not? Is this just another repeat of the the Kabuki theater, uh, the drama, and then it just all goes away? You know, some of these issues that are that are coming out right now around uh, the Biden administration, the Biden family in particular, the relationships with China and with the Ukraine, et cetera, uh, do feel of a different order, a different magnitude. Uh, we're right in the middle of it, so we'll see how this all how this all plays out. But uh, it, this is, in, in my view, something that uh, we haven't seen in our lifetime. Yeah, I agree. I think there's also it's it's potentially similar to like an end of a world war or the end of a world reserve currency, end of empire type of behavior. But I think there's a really serious math problem coming, Michael, because if your thesis holds out that interest rates stay higher for longer, the U.S. federal government, the U.S. Treasury has to refinance all that debt at much higher interest rates. We're headed towards a trillion dollars per year in interest payments on the national debt. And then you have a right. very serious math problem where just interest payments on the debt takes up way too much of the annual tax receipts. And this is why I've said repeatedly that I think inflation wins at the end of the day, because at some point they just have to give up. They have to give up the fight. It's in their economic interest to do so. Um, but they won't be able to uh, to do the, the sort of things that are required to really uh, break the back of inflation. Volcker, when he did what he did, it was extremely painful. But the government, the U.S. government was not indebted at the time. And so he had a degree of freedom here that the central bank, the Federal Reserve and the Treasury don't have today for the reasons that you just said, you know, we're going to hit somewhere between 750 and even 800 a billion in interest payments this year, this coming fiscal year in fiscal 24. A trillion dollars is just, is just around the corner. I mean, we spend 700, 800 billion a year on, uh, on the military. So this is now one of our largest line items uh, in the entire, entire federal budget. And at the same time, we're finding investors less and less willing to invest under these terms. What terms? Would higher yields change the fact that China has made a, a strategic decision to, uh, they're not going to stop investing in the U.S. They're not going to completely you know, sell, all their, sell all their treasuries and get out. It's not possible and not healthy for them or for us, but they have been on a trajectory that they're going to continue on which is to diversify away from, from the U.S. dollar. And it's not something that they can do overnight or want to do overnight. We are still their most important trading partner. And the relationship between and China and the U.S. matters a lot. But the direction of travel is clear. Where they're going, what does that mean? That we're going to end up monetizing more and more of our debt. The Federal Reserve will not succeed in this attempt to shrink its balance sheet. And they will be back in a position of having to take on... Uh, Take on more debt and be the buyer uh, of, of last resort for its own for its own government. Well, the Fed doesn't even count these currency swap lines they've given out to the European Central Bank over the years on the balance sheet. I heard from someone nine months ago who speaks to DC Fed people. They had over three trillion in currency swap lines outstanding already nine months ago that they weren't even counting. So who knows that the Fed's official balance sheet number? I think is total bullshit. They, thank you for reminding me of that. You know, so yeah, so you've got all these off balance sheet commitments. You know, which end up, if you were a normal company, would be in a footnote somewhere or there's be supplemental information or something like that. Uh, I don't think there was adequate disclosure around it from the Fed. And I think you're absolutely right that it, it, the, the actual liability is, is not being measured. It's not being uh, disclosed or really considered, at least outside of the halls of the Federal Reserve. Well, did you see a couple of days ago? I think it came out last night. The Fed released a quarterly report and they, they said that they have 20 uh, around $900 billion in losses. They've been running losses for a while. I mean, the, the, the Federal Reserve is insolvent, and uh, you know how that how that ends is a mystery of magic accounting, I suppose, at some point. Um, but that that has been the case. At the same time, while they've been paying uh, out to the big banks to keep uh, reserves on deposit at the, at the Federal Reserve, so the big banks have loved this environment. They've made if you have access to the Fed window and access to those to those lines. To the reverse, reverse repos and others, uh, the banks are just printing money. So of course they're not going to lend to to Main Street. They don't need it. They park their money at the private reserves of the Fed, make their uh, four or five percent, whatever the number is, and yeah, the, the Fed's P and L and ultimately balance sheet turns upside down. How it ends, we'll find out. 
Well, it probably will continue until the dollar loses world reserve currency. But I really enjoyed our discussion today, Michael. I want to thank you again for your time. We'll definitely have you back on again in the not too distant future. If my listeners want to take a look at your work, how do they do so? Yeah, the easiest way is just go to stormwall.com, which is a website. My website has all my writings. Uh, You can also access my videos. They're on YouTube. But uh, that's stormwall.com is just sort of the one-stop shop to be able to at least get uh, get access to all the good stuff, videos, articles, uh, my books, and, and other good things.